Hello Tech Pros, episode 175. Welcome to the podcast where I chat with professionals who are getting the job done using technology seven days a week. Each week we start with Motivation Monday. Tuesday is about productivity, Wednesday, leadership, Thursday, technology, Friday, people in communication, Saturday, entrepreneurship, and Sunday, being unplugged. All right, let's get started. Hello, Tech Pros. This is Chad Bostic, and I'm excited to continue our discussion on Dungeons and Dragons and building an epic role playing game, an epic new campaign for all of you players out there who want to play. So, this is a multi part series. This is part five so far of a multi part series on uh, role playing games. So if you missed it, go back and check it out. On part one, we talked about the 10 business lessons learned in role-playing games. Part two, how to interview players for your D&D campaign by playing board games and understanding who would be a good fit for your RPG and who would be a good fit for maybe a different style of game that you like playing. Uh, In part three, we talked about how to pick a genre and system for your role-playing game. There's so many different options to choose from. And so uh, you may have only heard of Dungeons and Dragons or only heard of Pathfinder or only knew that there were, uh, you know, action adventure, uh, high fantasy games, but there's a ton of other systems out there, a ton of other genres out there to choose from. So check that one out. And then last week, last Sunday on part four, we talked about developing an epic D&D campaign story. And so in that particular episode, we talked about how it's kind of like writing a book or kind of like writing a series of books, like a a series, a a trilogy or or five or seven books, where it's not just the first adventure, right? The first adventure is the hook that gets people playing, but really you have to have a scope bigger and broader than that to guide players and guide the characters to the things that are going to be uh, really epic, right? A, a really an amazing story that gets people coming back again and again and again is if you have this overall vision that really um, breaks down the the overall campaign, the overall story, which could be multiple re- years, right? You could be playing this game for two years, three years, or four years. And if you have an epic overall story thought out and planned out at least a little bit ahead of time, uh, then you'll have a much better idea of when the character should be progressing, when they should be delayed, when they should be really like having these dramatic, oh my God, moments and so forth. So um, check that episode out. That was episode, what was that? 168. So you can go to hellotechpros.com slash 168 for last week's episode. And uh, let me just recap because we we actually had a little bit of a campaign hook that we developed on that episode. And uh, through through that episode, I talked about how you do it. But we, we started with an example of a campaign hook that I'm going to expand upon in today's episode. So today's episode is about like actually developing that first arc or that first uh, act in a multi-act play, right? So first of all, what is the overall thing? What is the overall thing that we're doing? Well, the short pitch, the short pitch just for your players that the players need to understand is that several primitive and diverse tribes have assembled their leaders and heroes together to determine how to pacify the primordial spirits which have been devastating the area. Okay, so that's that's kind of the overall goal that we have. And then... You can go to um, hellotechpros.com slash 168, go back to that episode and really dive into the bigger picture here. What is going on other than that? So what's going to happen? Um, so basically it is across all the lands where the springs and tributaries feed into the mighty Del Gentis River. The primordial spirits are angry. Earthquakes, blizzards, tornadoes, floods, and wildfires, which were once rare, are now more common and deadlier than ever. Crops have been destroyed, herds of animals scattered and killed, and entire communities have been completely wiped out. The primitive and diverse tribes that populate the region have assembled their tribal elders, war chiefs, shamans, and scouts to determine how to pacify the spirits of earth, fire, air, and water from their frequent episodes of wanton destruction. And again, going back to that that episode last week, where we talked about why having a campaign hook like this is important. That's to sell your players on the idea of why we're here. 
what is it about? What are we going to have? Like, what are the main ideas? What are the, the main goals that we're going to accomplish? And that kind of tells us, okay, this is not a modern day military thing. This is the high fantasy world. So in this particular example, we're using the Dungeons and Dragons uh, kind of um, uh, system to play but really, this kind of story could be applicable across, uh, you know, Pathfinder. It could be uh, a- applicable to a homebrew situation. So what's important here is how we're developing the story and how we're developing the characters and the, the things that are going to be within the story. So now that we know here this campaign hook, now that we have the campaign hook that we established in the last episode, it's what do we do next? Okay, so we don't need to focus on what are the things that are going to be happening on level 20 and on level 24 and what kind of monsters they're going to be fighting and who's going to be the ultimate bad guy. Right now, what we we kind of need to have a hint of that. We need to like have in the back of our mind some of the obstacles and some of the challenges and some of the people that our players might interact with someday in the future. But... Um, Again, that's on last week's episode on 168. We kind of dove into what that overall structure is going to be. This episode is really about the the current, the modern, the the or the uh, the near time games, right? So what those sessions are going to be like in the early portions of the game, and how to really get that established. So what I like to do is. Uh, Now that I have that overall um, campaign hook, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull inspiration. Okay, so what is this land like? What is this period like? What are the peoples like? And so I'm going to look for inspiration in life, in modern day life or in historical life and try to come up with um, some examples of things that really inspire me and get me into the mindset of being a game master and um, what types of artifacts, what types of people, what types of, of communication and, um, and lifestyles that we're going to see here. So in these primitive, um, what do we call it? The, uh, the primitive and diverse tribes that are assembling their leaders and heroes to determine how to pacify these primordial spirits. So to me, I'm thinking back to, um, to times in, in our society. So I'm from the U.S., duh, you guys knew that. So uh, the American Indian tribes are a big inspiration to this particular campaign. And so I think of things like the Lakota uh, Indians, uh, which are which are a flavor of the Sioux Indians, and they are plainsmen. They're hunters. They're tribe uh, travelers, right? They they follow um, they follow herds of bison. They follow herds of antelope, and they're very much uh, nomads. They are nomadic society where they're constantly on the move because uh, their lifestyle is dependent on the animals that they hunt, and the animals that they hunt are very kind of migratory, and they move. Uh, across the plains following the food source. And so the Lakota Lakota Indians would follow their food source and also their supply of, uh, you know, leather and um, bones and and tooling and stuff like that. So I really like the idea of having one of the tribes be this type, right? So we're not going to copy it word for word. We're not going to copy it exactly how the Sioux Indians or the Lakota Lakota Indians um live their life and and the types of animals that they hunted but we want to use that as inspiration okay so really this whole first phase of building this campaign building this first campaign arc is really about where are you pulling your inspiration from so the lakota indians and then the i don't know if i'm pronouncing it correctly or not but the tlingit tlingit indians um so think of the coastal pacific northwest indians so these folks are are heavy into the fishing economy uh, they're islanders. They live on the coast. Um, they're not as nomadic as the Lakota Indians. They're very much kind of established because um, they are of the sea, right? And they are of the, the islands where they live. And so they don't necessarily range as much as the other Indians do uh, or the other tribes do. Uh, they're more sedentary they uh not necessarily sedentary in as an individual person they just sit there but their lifestyle is more established more um localized if you will and so their culture is going to be all about the fish and the sea and the ocean and the waves uh very much kind of a 
uh, a water-based culture. The next culture would be based off of the Seminoles. So uh, I'm currently in Florida and I'm originally from Oklahoma. And so uh, there's a lot of, of the Seminole culture that's in both of these locations where I'm from. And um, when I think of the Seminoles, um, what I think are people who are extremely fiercely independent, like they love their independence. And the original Seminoles were, uh, were as I understand it, refugees of wars that happened in other tribes uh, north of Florida. And so it's where all these, these refugees banded together in Florida um, they they fled from these wars. They fled from these uh, uh, oppressive situations that were going on, and they built their own culture that was very much uh, open to trade. And they were completely independent. and And they kind of had, uh, you know, different people in their tribe from different types of cultures, different types of other tribes, and they all blended together. It was like kind of a, a, a mini America. Um, you know, I could be completely way off on this from an actual historical standpoint, but that's what I kind of remember from eighth grade uh, Oklahoma history. Uh, the next culture that I want to take inspiration from are the Mayans. So if you remember the Mayans, they were extremely advanced in architecture and in writing, mathematics and calendars and uh, uh, astronomical systems, right? So they had... Uh, a lot of science, and they had a lot of uh, mathematics and a lot of engineering. They they built all the big pyramids in uh, in Mexico, Central America. Um, they had calendars. They they predicted uh, different things from the weather to um, uh, you know what what were the seasons going to be like and so forth. And very very advanced. Uh, think of uh, like academic society. The next society that, uh, next couple of societies, I don't have a lot of knowledge about, but I have done a little bit of research and uh, I'm kind of fascinated by their by their cultures. Are there, are the uh, Keapo, Keapo, I think you pronounce it, Keapo uh, societies in Brazil. So think of like the rainforest peoples, the people that live in the rainforest and um, they are completely against the deforestation and the mining that is very popular in that area of the world, right? Because those natural resources are extremely, extremely valuable. Um, You know, people want to do logging to get to the trees. People want to clear the land in order to uh, create uh, more farming. Uh, They want to mine for sapphires or for uh, precious jewels. And the Keapo are are, are very much kind of, um, you know, very much for nature and for the rainforest and protecting the animals, protecting um, the the environment that really supports their lifestyle. They're also very big into myth and cosmology, right? Of of having different gods and goddesses that they worship and and uh, that they believe kind of you know that the nature spirits, the nature gods, really control. Um, the life that they live in and the environment that they live in. And so you want to appease those people. Uh, And then the final one that I have for my particular inspiration are the Maori, which are from New Zealand. So think of Islanders a little bit different from the Tlingit from the uh, coastal Pacific Northwest um, Indians and the Americas. But these folks are, are more warlike and they're very competitive and they've built a culture of, you know, competition and fighting and really just kind of that, that masculine energy of, of being tough, super tough, and to be able to prove themselves in battle, prove themselves in, um, you know, any kind of competitive spirit that they could to see kind of like who's the boss, who's the top dog. So those are the inspirations that I'm going to be pulling from for this little example campaign. And the point to all this is um, really look at different cultures, right? So wherever you grew up, whoever you talk to, uh, whoever you are around, that's great inspiration. But also look to other cultures outside of your environment. And um, even if you don't really truly understand it, that's that's fine. That's great. Do a little research and uh, talk to different people in real life uh 
everyday settings and get to know a little bit about their culture, about their history, and try to pull some of those elements into the game. So the more diverse that you can make the game, the more diverse elements you can bring into the game, but also have that that touch of realism and that touch of historical. To me, personally, it kind of brings in a lot of depth into the game and makes it a lot more fun to play because it kind of feels like that movie that you saw last weekend that just came out, right? Or it kind of feels like that book that you read in, in 11th grade that was like so uh, so foreign yet so action adventure at the same time. Um, kind of reminds you of those uh, historical shows that you've seen on the History Channel uh, and, and those, those stories that people have told over the ages. But it's got your own flair because you're, you're taking that inspiration and then you're applying like the D&D universe on top of it, right? So, okay, so we have the indigenous peoples, the inspiration for the indigenous peoples. Now, what else is important? What else are we going to have in our game? Well, as a game master, one of the biggest things you have to think about are the locations. So what are the first locations that your players are going to be playing in? Where are they going to be active? How are they all going to be together? And what is it? So in this example, um, the location that we're all meeting in, the location that the uh, the players, all the characters would be meeting in and figuring out that there is this global problem or this regional problem that they need to solve together is this, this great gathering place of all the tribes. So uh, I'm going to imagine here that, um, that this is on or very near to the river itself. So again, in last episode, we talked about how these people are from like all the tributaries of what I'm calling the Nelgentes River, which is a, a, you know, a made up name that I, that I'm named, but think of like a major river system, right? So like the Mississippi River, if you're from the United States, um, the Nile, uh, the Amazon, right? These major, major river systems that have tons of tributaries, tons of smaller creeks and, and brooks and, and smaller rivers, tributaries that all feed into this major system. And so um, all of these different tribes kind of come from different areas. There's mountainous regions, there's coastal regions, uh, there's plains, and they all are affected by the health and uh, of this river system and they all feed into the health of this river system if you will and so i'm gonna i'm going to say that our gathering place is probably right here like on a major branch like where tons of these uh tributaries are feeding into the main nilgentes river itself right so it's kind of at this crossroads of multiple rivers pulling in together and uh, maybe it's even like an island as, you know, the, the big rivers kind of uh, ebb and flow and move left and right over the course of eons. And, and they kind of cut out and they naturally cut out these little uh, islands in the middle of a river. And so I'm going to imagine that my first gathering place where I'm going to have all the characters meet is on one of these islands because it just kind of seems like that's where all these different tribes would meet. You know, you got comes some coming downstream, some coming upstream, uh, you know, some walking in from far regions. Um, but it just sound, seems to me like a really cool place where where they would all meet to discuss, you know, some kind of some kind of problems that they need to work through. So the thing. Um, all right, so the next things we're going to think about about the location, now that we have the overall general, okay, it's it's where these tributaries meet and form the greater river. Now, as these tribes are meeting, as this kind of like miniature society is being created of all these desperate, disparate, desperate groups that are all meeting together, how are they arranged? Like, is it everybody um, intermingled together? Probably not. If you have a lot of these different cultures coming together, you know, birds of a feather kind of stick together, right? So we're probably going to have different sections of this um, area, different sections of this island. They're going to kind of be broken up. And whether it's officially designated as, you know, the area from the uh, coastal people, and this is the area for the rainforest people and whatnot, or if it's just going to be kind of naturally people tend to stick together in their area of town, if you will. Not that this is really a town because these are all kind of uh, rural folks. But anyway, 
uh, how is it laid out? Like what's, what's the arrangement? How are they decorated? So going back to the inspiration from the different tribes, how are each of our tribes in our games decorated? Like, um, you know, some may have banners and signs, right, to really represent the places that they come from. Others may have like taxidermy or um, hides and skulls of, of the animals that they, uh, that they hunt or they worship. Uh, others may be more mythical, right? So we've got some of the, the rainforest tribes and the, uh, and the island tribes that are very much on, on the cosmology space, right? So they may have masks that they've painted. They may have very decorated idols. And so, um, you know, how, how are they presenting themselves externally? And then, um, you know, each of the leaders from these tribes is probably going to have his or her own tent or their own lodging of some sort. And so, you know, that's going to be kind of like the central, the biggest, the uh, the most extravagant, um, not necessarily the most typical, the most, but the most extravagant, um, um, most extravagant place or extravagant. Um, I mean, it doesn't necessarily be a tent, right? It could be a treehouse. It could be uh, an underground lodging, but just a residence, right? Where these people are hanging out, where these people are meeting, right? Because you have the overall meeting where, that we're going to have all the tribal elders get together, but then each one of the tribes, each one of the elders is probably going to have his or her own meeting space and, and residence um, that they could potentially interact with our player characters. Okay, and then um, this overall meeting place, like how does each tribe feel about this location? So maybe one of the tribes feels that this is like a blessed spot. Like this is absolutely uh, a holy spot because, you know, they, they very much believe into the, um, that the, that the animal spirits or that the mother nature spirits kind of bring all of these cultures together to bring all of these energies together from all over the far reaches of the, of the plains and the mountains and the uh, rainforest and so forth and kind of bring them all together. And so this is kind of a, a melding of, you know, um, all the different landscapes. And so they're going to think this is a holy spot. Others are going to think this is a very great defensive spot from like a military tactics point of view, because um, if you're on an island, it's it's very difficult to get to. Uh, others are going to think that this is ridiculous, that they had to travel all the way from the very depths of the plains, from way out in the middle of nowhere to come to this location. And um, maybe they're used to traveling all the time. It's not that big a deal. Or maybe they're not used to traveling and they had to get really, really far to get here. And it just feels completely foreign to them. And they're nervous or they're upset or they think people are trying to take advantage of them. Um, but either way, you really want to tap into what are these people about and, and how does the people and the location, like how do they blend together to really determine what they think about stuff and how they present themselves in these situations. Because as we put our player characters into these situations, what we want to do is add a lot of depth. We want to add a lot of flavor, but we also want to make it kind of realistic, right? Where it's, where it's not just, oh, the antagonist is pissed off because he's a pissy person, but the antagonist really has in his or her own mind a valid reason why um, this is not cool. Like we should not be doing this. We should be following me or we should be following my elder, right? And not yours. So we want to, uh, we want to provide that depth and richness and really understand why each of these, uh, each of these peoples care or does not care or, uh, is being driven crazy by this particular location. So the next thing that we're going to talk about is, uh, the first quest the very first quest that we want to have um, in our first level adventure, our first level campaign. But first, we're going to take a quick break and thank our sponsors. This episode of Hello Tech Pros is sponsored by Minio Cloud Storage. Minio is a cloud object storage server for developers and DevOps written in Go. The Go programming language is the emerging language of choice for modern cloud infrastructure projects and it allows Minio to be highly concurrent and lightweight. 
Minio is Amazon S3 compatible, built with microstorage architecture in mind, but at its heart, Minio is simple, scalable, and supported by a passionate developer and user community. In episode 89 of Hello Tech Pros, I talked with A.B. Periasami, one of the founders of Minio, about the importance of community support and recruiting software developers who are as passionate about their product's code as artists are of their art. Check out that episode at hellotechpros.com slash 89 and check out Minio Cloud Storage at minio.io. That's M-I-N-I-O dot I-O. Okay, we're back and talking about our very first D&D adventure that we're going to put together. So this is a five or, or a multi-part series. I'm not sure if it's five part or six part or seven part, but a multi-part series about building your own D&D campaign. Uh, last week, we talked about what is the overall epic story? How do you get that five to seven part uh, like act in a play or a five part book series and and break it down into what are the major elements that are going on across the entire campaign. This week we're talking about how to kick it off, like how to kick off the actual campaign with where the people are starting. And so a few minutes ago, we were talking about both the inspiration of where you get the idea for the campaign, where you get the idea for the peoples and the culture, and also the locations of where these people are at. So we talked about six different uh, historical indigenous peoples um, that I mentioned that I'm going to get inspiration for for my game. And then the locations, the major location of, of where this action is taking place, at least for the first couple of chapters or the first couple of interactions, the first couple of quests. And so we talked about it is in the, uh, like, where the branches of this major river system kind of meet and form the main river itself. And maybe perhaps on an island, like one a huge island space in the middle of uh, this river system. And so the first quest that we want to have, um, you know, <laughs> almost so many different campaigns start off with, well, you're in a tavern, you're in a bar, and it gets attacked by goblins. And and uh, those are fun. I've, I've run those and I've played in those, and those can be a lot of fun. But I think in this case, what I would really like to do and really have you think about doing is have the first quest not be an action quest. Have the first quest not be a fight where the players are fighting against some evil minions of some overlord that are coming in to attack, but really have a a social quest, a social uh, interactivity. And that means... Um, where they really have to explain where they're from, who they are, what they feel about different topics. So instead of a fight with swords and and spears and and arrows and stuff like that, how about maybe a battle of wits or a battle of mind or or a battle of influence where the people are really getting a chance to introduce themselves and talk about their particular tribes. So maybe the first quest is really that each of the players that are gathered here uh, in this game, in your game, uh, for this particular game, for this particular instance, what I would have them do is each one of them would be appointed a representative of the tribe to really convince people of, well, first of all, just inform people of what problems are going on in their particular tribe, right? Maybe they've had earthquakes or volcanoes. Maybe they've had tornadoes or hurricanes where they're from but they either way no matter where they come from they've had these problems these these the <laughs> the gods have gone nuts um the weather systems have gone crazy right the the primordial elements the earth fire wind and air uh are all just completely nuts so going on here and we're trying to convince people that first of all they should listen to us like we know what we're talking about there are bad things out there and we have like honest um, we have information to share that may be applicable to everyone else. And second of all, we're trying to convince them to come help us. Come help us in all our uh, volcano problem and get it to settle down. Come help us in our, uh, you know, flooding problem because it's, it's washing everything away and it's going to affect everything downstream in the river system. So I'm going to make that first quest uh, in our example be a uh, a talkie a talkie quest instead of a fighting quest and so i would have each person kind of you know as the person as the player came up with their character and which one of these tribes that they fit into 
also come up with, help me come up with what are the problems that that area has and what is that individual's backstory, but also what is the backstory of that culture or the backstory of that tribe that they're representing. And then as the first, um, the first campaign game or the first session, campaign session, I would have them have like a monologue where they can really talk about it and not just say, hi, my name is Bill. Uh, my character is a, uh, a dwarf fighter and uh, he loves drinking and smashing things with his ax. Okay, that's great. That's how you like introduce who you are and, and what your player is, but really introduce the culture and introduce uh, the tribe and not just, I mean, I'm, uh, that's great. If you say, my name is Bill and, uh, and I have a dwarf fighter, that's great, but if you're doing that in front of all these other tribes, you know what is their reaction going to be? Uh, how are are they going to think that this this uh, this dwarven fighter is respected or not respected? And so that first uh, that first session, I really want the players to invest a lot of time and energy into talking about all the different things that are happening in their tribes and talking about all the interesting things in their own character backstory that really engages everyone else that's at the table or everyone else that's at this meeting place to try to get their attention. Because what we want to do is have compelling engaging NPCs that are uh, compelling characters that, that people want to follow and people want to hear about because that will make the NPCs more invested in what's going on with the characters' lives and it will also make the other characters or the other players at the character the other players at the table more interested in their own characters as well as the other characters that are being played or portrayed at the table. So that would be my first session. And then after that, after that introduction one, which I would really have probably last an entire session or maybe even two sessions, depending on how long we would play. But I would really look at two to four hours worth of worth of just pure role playing for that, that first session and uh, not have fights break out, have maybe verbal fights break out, but not really dive into um, okay you're you're all being attacked by you know water elementals now or anything like that have it just be about um, how these cultures are interacting how these cultures and these individual people are uh, communicating to each other and where are the struggles where are the breakdowns and where are the cooperations happening and then the second the second session after that is where I would first introduce the first you know physical, obstacle or physical challenge and that probably would be some sort of proving grounds right so think of um think of uh, the proving grounds like a like a uh, an obstacle course or miniature quests like the at the olympics right at the olympics that we just uh finished up in uh, summer of 2016 right they the olympics started or was inspired by uh, different feats of strength and of skill and of athleticism um, that people um, competed in way back in the day, and now we still continue that tradition today. So maybe it's your local Olympics for these different tribes, and and what are they competing on? And so I would create little skill challenges or little um, uh, battles based off of this. So maybe it's it's uh there's probably strength type quests or or strength type um yeah i'll call them quests mini mini quests right um competitions strength based competitions where they're lifting heavy things they're throwing heavy things there's probably races different foot races um it may be who can who can climb the tall trees the fastest or who can swim up river the fastest who can run a foot race uh, maybe it's kind of a triathlon thing where they have multiple little mini races built together there's probably archery competitions, either either throwing their spears or shooting their bows and arrows. Um, there might be other other competitions that are are not really represented in our Olympics or not really represented in in um, the kind of normal fighting type things you would think of. But maybe it's a it's a a test of will, right? Where you're dancing on hot coals and who can who can do the, the best dance moves, but also stay on the hot coals the longest in order to prove they're really, really 
um, have control of their mind or control of their spirit. Maybe there's there's other things, other miniature quests that you can throw in here to really throw the players for a loop, but also give them a chance to really shine with their their skills and their attributes that they've invested all their you know their skill points on and so forth. Okay, so that's going to wrap up this particular episode on um, how to put together the first campaign arc for your D&D campaign. Uh, if you tune in next week, you know what? We're, I think we're going to continue this at least one more week because I got a lot of information on how to develop the NPCs, the non-player characters, and the associations within the tribes, as well as you know where to do this research like how i do my research for my campaigns before i put one together or while i'm putting one together and uh, what are some tics, tips and tricks in that area if you're interested in this campaign i'm starting to now that i'm i'm uh, i'm really thinking about i want to play this i want to play this game so i i started this series with just kind of an educational hey uh, let's talk about dnd because i didn't have a lot of uh guests signing up for the beam unplugged episodes but now that i'm really talking through designing this system like i want to play it so if you're interested in playing this particular campaign with me or if you want to get more information on how to be a game master to build this particular game or to build a game with this kind of flavor you can go to hellotechpros.com slash dnd that's uh, like Dungeons and Dragons, but instead of an ampersand, it's N, the letter N. So think of like David Nelson Davidson, right? I don't know. Just kind of came up. Um, D-N-D Dungeons Nincompoop Dragons. I don't know. D-N-D. HelloTechPros.com slash D-N-D. Uh, I have a sign up form there. will uh, allow you to get in contact with me specifically about the D&D campaign. And, uh, and, and in that first email, I'll send you back. I'll say, Hey, do you want to play this with me? Or do you want to know how to run this campaign? And depending on what you pick in that little miniature survey, I'll send you that appropriate information. Next week, we will be talking about how to develop NPCs, very engaging NPCs to interact with your characters. Um, and until next time, take care. The show notes page for this episode can be found at hellotechpros.com slash 175. Do you use Slack for team communication? Join the Hello Tech Pros Slack channel at hellotechpros.com slash Slack. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a review, subscribe to this channel, and check back tomorrow. This has been Sunday Being Unplugged, but tomorrow my featured guest and I will get fired up and ready to face the week with Motivation Monday. On Tuesday, we'll be discussing productivity, Wednesday, leadership, Thursday, technology, Friday, people and communication, Saturday, entrepreneurship, and back again on Sunday to get unplugged. And I'll talk to you tomorrow. Tomorrow.